On Monday, we left Dr. Zelensky and his compatriot in more than just a little spot of bother over in Silverwood's prison in episodes 1 and 2 of the Zelensky Project. Now, as promised, I'm returning to the story this evening to conclude it with parts 3, 4, and 5. So, my dear friends, are you ready for more mystery, intrigue, and murder? I do so hope you are, because it's time once again to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. After a mostly sleepless night, I arrived much earlier than usual in the morning. I found Dr. Zelensky and Howard having breakfast together. Howard usually worked the night shift, but today he was assigned to the infirmary alongside myself. What's happening today? I asked. Unscheduled prison transfer, Howard said. From where? Nobody knows. But soon a bus will arrive with anything from zero to ten prisoners, and they all have to be checked. Zelensky was reading a newspaper dated two weeks ago while sipping his coffee, completely ignoring my presence. Before I could sit down with them, a phone started ringing. Zelensky was brought to attention and answered the call letting out a few mumbles, signifying that he heard whoever was on the other end, and then he hung up. All right, guys, we've got three new prisoners, and they're all of the peculiar type, so this might take a while. When you say peculiar, do you mean like Harold in room 144? Or, um, like the basement people? Howard asked. Uh, yes, Zelensky said. Ah, that's not a very helpful response, Howard replied. It didn't take more than a few minutes before a couple of guards I hadn't seen before came walking up to the infirmary, rolling a wheelchair in front of them. A small, thoroughly broken man was sitting naked in the wheelchair. I say man, but, well, any gender assigned to him would be a dubious proposition at best, if he could even be classified as a human being. He simply appeared as a naked torso, with a head attached on top. No arms nor any legs, completely rid of hair. His torso was naked, not only without clothes, but not a navel or nipples to be seen. Whoa, what the fuck is that? Howard asked. Keep quiet, Zelensky shouted back. They are people, so show some damn respect. Right, people. We both kept quiet while Zelensky whispered with the guards and was handed a patient chart. All right, kid, roll him into the examination room, he told me. I did as commanded. Considering whether I should introduce myself to the creature sitting in the chair, but, well, he had no ears to listen through or eyes to observe me with. His entire body seemed to be covered in third-degree burns that had healed horribly and unevenly. Doctor, what's going on with this guy? Is he even aware of his surroundings? I asked. I seriously doubt it. But I've seen weirder things, so just be polite. Should I introduce myself or something? Howard interjected, as he was waving his arm in front of the man's face. No. In fact, you should wait outside. There's a high chance you'll end up in a similar chair if you don't leave right now, Zelensky said visibly agitated by Howard's behavior. The creature twitched and moaned as Zelensky prodded him with various needles, taking blood and checking abdominal reflexes. The usual doctor stuff I am unqualified to judge. He hated every second of it, and as he screamed in agonized confusion, I saw his tongue was nothing but a mere stump of flesh sitting in the middle of his mouth. He was helpless due to his disability, and despite his most valiant efforts of resistance, he was a short study. Zelensky, after years in the clinic, had become far too experienced to let any kind of crap distract him from getting the job done. All right, I'm done. Howard, will you take this guy to cell block B? We need him out of harm's way. Howard came running back into the room. Yes, sir, he responded, before rolling him away. 
Zelensky glanced back at the list he had neatly placed on his desk. His mouth contorted into a subtle frown. He thought for a moment before explaining the situation to me. I have my suspicions about the next patient. I think he'll be difficult, so I need you to be ready, all right? I nodded in silence. Difficult people had been a large part of my previous occupations, so I wasn't all that worried. But the thought of dealing with another bizarre situation lingered in my mind. All right, Dr. Zelensky, this is patient number 987. An unknown guard said as he rolled in a rather muscular man in his early forties. His body was limp, but he appeared to be breathing. Is he sedated or something? Zelensky asked. God knows. He's been like this for the past few months since we found him. Got ordered to move him here, so now he's your problem. Zelensky sighed. His muscles sure didn't atrophy. He's definitely going to be trouble. The man was massive. Not only did he look like Arnold Schwarzenegger in his prime, but he was as tall as a redwood tree. Safe to say, I was terrified by his appearance alone, despite him being fast asleep. I held my hand close to my taser. At that point, I wish I'd been given a real weapon. Zelensky carefully approached the new inmate and put a stethoscope to his chest. Very soft touch at first, and then, with increasing confidence, he checked the patient out. As the patient examination progressed, I relaxed my previously trigger-happy hand, hoping it would be as peaceful as with the last person. I kept a watchful eye on Zelensky as he worked with the inmate. I even felt brave enough to pull my smartphone out of my pocket, just to check if someone had messaged me on any social media completely forgetting that no signal would reach my phone. Big goddamn mistake. Time had, as always, escaped me in a more than natural manner. That time it was just a couple of minutes, but those were all it took for the man to regain his consciousness and start attacking Dr. Zelensky. When I regained my sense of time, he was strangling my beloved supervisor. <sighs> Help me. He forcefully pushed words through his throat as the man crushed him. I drew my taser with precision and pulled the trigger. It only had that one charge and it hit the man square on his forehead. He was noticeably distressed, but kept his hands firmly around Zelensky's throat. The only other option was to hit him with my baton. It was just enough to make him let go of the doctor and redirect his attention toward me. The attack was perfectly timed for Howard to return and assist us. He jumped on the new inmate's back and held his arm in a locked position. I assisted, and together we somehow managed to secure the prisoner to his chair. Howard quickly jammed a needle into his neck, sedating him in seconds. Shit, Doc. Are you alright? Howard asked nervously. Zelensky lied on the floor, grabbing his throat while gasping for air. Of course, I only had my fucking trachea crushed just then. <laughs> Having secured the prisoner, Zelensky told us to move him to a quarantine cell temporarily. We handed him off to a couple of guards working at the relevant cell block and returned to the doctor. God, just bring in the last one, he said. The third patient appeared perfectly normal, if not a bit frail. He politely greeted Zelensky and introduced himself as Patrick Davis. All right, Mr. Davis, so I'm just going to check your vitals and take a blood sample. Any problems you care to mention? Nothing at all, Doctor. In fact, I can assure you I'm quite healthy, Davis said. His accent was peculiar, almost British, but with a hint of something unknown. Right. I'll just check your vitals and take some blood, then. As you wish. But I'm afraid my stay here will be rather short. Short? According to this, you're supposed to be locked away for the next thirty years, Howard interrupted. Davis looked at Howard for a brief moment and smiled. That's a nice watch you have there, Mr. Banks. Would you mind parting with it? 
His watch was neatly hidden under his sweater. No way Davis could have seen it, and Howard was visibly shocked. He hadn't even introduced himself, yet Davis knew his name. Howard kept quiet. Well, once you see fit, you can drop by my cell and drop it off. No need to look tough in front of your colleagues. At this point, Zelensky jumped in to continue the examination. Both Howard and I exchanged concerned looks with each other. You're a good doctor, Davis said. It's a shame about your wife. Oh, she was such a be- You shut your damn mouth, Zelensky yelled. The room fell silent. Zelensky took a few breaths before composing himself. He's fine. Take him to cell block C. Let the guards find a suitable new abode for him. Dr. Zelensky, I meant no offense. Clearly it wasn't your fault. I only meant to... Shut your mouth, or I'll shut it for you. Howard and I rushed out of there with Davis, a peculiar man with a strange ability. Despite everything, he seemed more normal than the rest. What was that about Zelensky's wife? Howard dared ask. I don't believe that's any of your concern, Davis responded. Right. Tell you what, you hand me the watch, and I'll tell you a prediction. Howard hesitated. Oh, it's not like it's worth more than a few hundred dollars. Half out of what I assumed to be a morbid sense of curiosity, and half out of fear, Howard handed over his watch. Thank you, Mr. Banks. So, what's the prediction? Tomorrow is Thursday. On this particular day, as I'm sure you're well aware, cell block D does not belong to you. How the hell do you know about that? Howard shot back. As confused as I was speechless, I intently listened to the next part of the conversation. Oh, the owners are quite fond of me, and I would kindly ask you both stay out of the way. There won't be any need for violence. So, um, they're going to break you out? I asked. No, not at all. They're going to bring me over to their realm. Before I could ask anything else, a guard grabbed Davis's arm and ordered us not to talk to him. He quickly guided Davis away to cell block C and waved his arm for us to leave. Just remember, gentlemen, stay away from block D tomorrow and it'll all be fine. But the fine Dr. Zelensky is on borrowed time. Davis yelled from his cell as we walked away. As we got ready to leave for the day, neither of us said a word. Davis appeared as a normal man, but after all I'd seen... He somehow had a keen ability to evoke fear from somewhere deep and dark in my soul. Something definitely feels very wrong about tomorrow. Well, I didn't post yesterday, and I'm sorry. I promised an update each day, but well, I've been trapped in the prison overnight. I tried whatever I could think of to contact the outside world. But on top of the horrible phone service in the prison, something kept removing my messages. Zelensky is currently missing, and not a single person seems to even know that he existed. If anyone has answers, it would be Davis, but he has vanished as well. That's a lot for me to digest, but I'll do my best to explain what the hell has just happened over the time we've missed. As I arrived at the prison Thursday morning, I wasn't greeted by the dormant guard as usual. Herbert had left his book on the chair, and was inexplicably missing from his post. The eerie feeling from Davis's words from the day before had built up in my chest again, a bout of anxiety slowly demanding my attention. I rushed to the infirmary, in hopes of finding any of my co-workers. Just as I arrived, I got a glimpse of Herbert slapping the living hell out of Zelensky. Wake up, damn it, 
he yelled as he gave Zelensky another red cheek. Just seeing the mountain that is Herbert slapping someone half his size was horrifying to say the least, and I honestly wasn't sure whether to let him keep at it or to interfere. Zelensky was just standing in the middle of the infirmary with an empty stare, looking frailer than any of his patients. What's happening? I asked. Stubborn bastard just had to stay beyond his shift yesterday. Now he's frozen like this. Herbert saw the terror on my face. Oh, don't worry, rookie. It's not the first time this has happened to our good doctor. He gave him another forceful slap, and suddenly, Zelensky came back to himself with a violent gasp before collapsing to the ground. Oh, shit. Someone should probably have caught him, Herbert said. They brought Zelensky to what appeared to be a small guest room smack in the middle of the prison. It was worn out and so thickly covered in dust, I couldn't believe anyone had ever lived there. But Herbert said that Zelensky would rather die than to wake up in the infirmary like one of those godforsaken inmates. My job, as always, was to watch over him. Seemingly a pointless task at that point, but I obediently followed orders, patiently waiting for him to regain consciousness. It took three hours for Zelensky to wake up again. No sooner had he seen me than he started rambling incoherently in a bizarre language I had never heard. Davis, I need to talk to Davis, he finally said. He stumbled a bit as he got to his feet, but, as his usual self, he refused to let me help him. We rushed to cell block C, where we'd dumped Davis the day before. I need to speak to a prisoner, number 1597, Patrick Davis, Zelensky demanded from the assigned guard. The guard gave Zelensky a dull look. Sir, you need the proper documentation to make that request, he simply responded. Listen to me, you numbskull prick. I am one of the few senior staff members that remain here, Zelensky said, as he handed over his identification. The guard apologized and led us to a service station. He typed in the given information into the computer. As he did, a progressively more confused look appeared on his face. Doctor, there's no record of any Patrick Davis. Zelensky just sighed. Take me to cell number 233 then. The guard complied, taking us into the cell block. The one Zelensky had requested was bricked up, clearly closed for a long time. Though, we both remembered Davis being put there only yesterday. What happened here? Beats me. It's been like this since I started a year ago, the guard said. At that point, Zelensky had clearly given up on getting any useful information out of the guard. Agitated and defeated, he stormed off to his office at the infirmary. I just followed, a few steps behind him to avoid becoming the focus of his frustration. Once at the office, he rummaged through the bottom drawer, pulling out a half-empty bottle of whiskey. This is just one of those days. Sit down, he ordered me. Doctor, do you really think this is the best idea? I asked. You've seen the shit that goes on around here. This is the only right idea there is. He filled two glasses and chugged his down in one large gulp, before generously giving himself another glass. So, tell me. Why are you still here? he asked. It was a simple enough question, but I couldn't find any reasonable explanation. I had nothing in life worth staying for. No family to speak of, no close friends nor a girlfriend. Life was shit, and the job was all that remained. I don't have anywhere else to go, I simply said. Hmm, that's as good a reason as any. He responded as he held his glass up. Cheers. We sat there slowly finishing the bottle. My part in drinking was minuscule compared to Zelensky's, who appeared to be a veteran alcoholic. After what seemed like an eternity, Zelensky finally broke the awkward silence. 
You know, my wife was always better at this. She worked here too. No, but she was a doctor. And a great one. Loved her patients. Did whatever she could to help them. Much better than me. Why she even put up with my shit, I'll never know. What happened to her? She got sick. That's what always happens. The shit ones always prevail. Get a chance to live another day. While the best ones perish for no good fucking reason. He took another large sip of his drink. And I tried to save her too. Lost my damn medical license in the progress. That's how I ended up here. My only place that would hire someone like myself. I'm sorry, was all I could think to say. Yeah, well, good thing I ended up here, though. It was the only way I could rescue her. So, your wife is still alive? Of course she is. What do you take me for? But, um, she's not exactly among... Zelensky was interrupted by the light starting to flicker above us, followed by a metallic clunk. It was just for a brief second, but once the light settled back, I could see the immediate change in Zelensky's composure. He was scared. In my brief tenure at the prison, I'd seen Zelensky display a wide range of angry emotions, but never fear. Shivers shot down my spine. Zelensky glanced at the clock on the wall. I turned to check it too. 8.55 p.m. It was another lapse in time. The biggest one I'd experienced yet. Dr. Zelensky? We need to check the exit. This is not how it's supposed to happen, he said as he drunkenly stumbled up from his chair and started jogging towards the door. To my surprise... Herbert was still sitting in his chair, facing away from us. Herbert! Zelensky shouted as we got closer. He didn't respond. I went over and tapped him carefully on his shoulder, before turning his chair around. I stumbled back in shock, as I realized his entire face was missing. Not torn off, or even wounded in any feasible way. His entire head was just covered in smooth skin, untouched and unharmed. Herbert had died, sitting in his chair with his beloved book. Zelensky pulled me away, telling me not to touch him, before checking the exit. Darkness, not due to lack of light, but because of a viscous fog occupying everything that existed beyond the door. Darker, than the coldest night. Vanta Black. What the hell's happening? We are trapped. The two of us stood frozen before the darkness, neither of us able to come up with any reasonable idea about what to do next. We wouldn't have to wait long to be jolted out of our shock. Something pulled us back with an intense sense of panic and hopelessness. A simple but horrifying sound emerging from the depths of cell block D. The sound of someone humming. It wasn't an ominous kind of humming. As innocent as someone just going about their day with a song stuck in their head. Oh, we better board ourselves up in the office, Zelensky said regaining a hint of his confidence. On the way, we kept our eyes open for any of the night staff. Howard should have been on shift, but was nowhere to be seen. The dark, viscous fog that had consumed the outside world also separated us from the other cell blocks. All we had left in our little horrific world was the infirmary and cell block D. According to the protocol, we never enter cell block D on Thursdays. What do we do now? I asked as we arrived at the office. I don't know. We just wait, I suppose. And Herbert? He is dead. If that's even him sitting in that chair, you never know in this place. 
Without alternative options, we simply waited. Neither of us speaking a word for what seemed like hours. Just sitting and listening to the ominous humming. The windows displayed nothing but the emptiness outside. Everlasting darkness stretching on and on. We were trapped in a prison. Not as inmates, but merely as unlucky employees. The lights flickered again. A few minutes of blinking lights before a large shatter echoed through the hallways, followed by darkness. The power had gone out. What the hell? The backup generator should have started by now, Zelensky said after a couple of minutes. He fumbled his way through the darkness and pulled out a couple of flashlights from a cupboard. It was enough to keep the room dimly lit, all save for the windows. The black fog had started seeping through the window as the lights went out. While the flashlights stopped the spread of darkness, it wasn't enough to penetrate the fog. Check the hallways, would you? Zelensky demanded. Just like with the windows, the fog that separated us from the rest of the prison had started spreading down the hallway towards us. With only a couple of flashlights, it wouldn't be long before it consumed us. Oh, fuck it. I'm just going to turn the generator on myself, he said. I thought back to the first day. I'd seen the generator room, but the only way to get there would be through cell block D, which was strictly off limits on Thursdays. Wait, wait, wait doctor, I started. I know the risks. That's why you're staying here. Keep that damn light pointed at the shadows. It'll slow them down. Zelensky rushed towards the godforsaken cell block. I stayed diligently behind and counted each second waiting for him to return. The darkness kept creeping up on me, barely halting in front of my light. For each moment that passed, the prison shrank enveloping in a blinding void of nothingness. In the distance, I could hear the sounds of heavy footsteps echoing through the prison. As far as I could tell, they were coming from cell block D, and I initially thought they belonged to Zelensky, but they kept multiplying. First one, then two, then four, and then shortly it had become an indescribable mess of heavy feet running around. I waited, and waited, longer than I should have, frozen in a mixture of confusion and fear. It wasn't until I noticed that all the clocks had stopped that I noticed that time itself wasn't actually moving. For all I know, I could have suffered another time lapse, and Zelensky could have died hours ago. The darkness had gotten so close, it could almost touch me, and with just a second to spare, I jumped out into the hallway as the void swallowed the office. My flashlight didn't even phase it anymore. It rapidly digested everything in its path, leaving me with no choice but to venture into cell block D. The lights flickered on for a moment, a loud electrical buzz sounding throughout the hallways before every single bulb in the building shattered into a million pieces and rained down on top of me. The humming stopped momentarily, but quickly returned even louder than before. Zelensky had turned on the generator, and it broke the lights. But even more than ever, he was in danger. With a sudden and unknown surge of bravery, I rushed towards the cell block, hoping I could do something, anything at all, to help Zelensky, even though I fully expected us both to die horrible deaths. I ran, and ran, and ran, the cell block never appearing around the corner as it should. Twists and turns in the hallway that had never existed before hindered my progress, throwing me into an endless loop. All the while the humming got louder, and I could distinguish between two different sources, one darker than the other, impossibly vibrating through the air. The other, familiar and yet I couldn't quite place it. Just on the brink of collapse, out of breath and presumably out of time, I arrived at the cell block. 
To my surprise, the man humming was Patrick Davis himself, the inmate that inexplicably escaped and suddenly stopped existing in any official records. Around him were dozens of tall, shadow creatures walking around the hall with large chains attached to their ankles. In front of Davis, a fracture, emitting intense light, hung in the middle of the air. Davis was staring down at his wristwatch, the one he'd gotten from Howard, and it seemed he was timing his hums to the clock. For each hum, another returned from the fracture portal in front of him. Zelensky was standing there too. Dr. Zelensky, I yelled. Both of them looked over at me, a wide smile appearing on Davis's face. I'm sorry. But the doctor is coming with me, he said. I walked over, but the shadow creatures moved to block the way. Zelensky, what are you doing? I asked. Stay back, kid. This is something that has to happen, Zelensky responded. What are you talking about? He said that if I help him, he'd bring me to my wife, Zelensky said. Don't do it, I begged. I don't have anything else to stay for. I took a step closer. One of the shadows kneeled down before me and opened its mouth impossibly wide, black fog pouring out from it. Davis signaled for the creature to stop. They won't hurt you if you stay back, Davis said. Unfortunately, you'll have to stay behind. But I see now, Zelensky was right about you. What the hell is that supposed to mean? That you'll be important for the future, Davis said. You're just gonna have to be patient, he added. He turned to Zelensky and nodded. It's time to go, Doctor. Zelensky gave me one last glance before they both stepped into the fracture, both vanishing before my eyes as they did. That's all I remember, before waking up on the floor, to Howard pouring a bucket of ice-cold water on me. Hey, what the hell happened to you? I must have babbled incoherently, because Howard didn't seem to understand a single thing that poured out of me. <sighs> Zelensky, I managed to stutter. What the hell is a Zelensky? Howard asked. They later told me Herbert suffered a massive heart attack, which medically made sense considering his size. Other than that, he appeared perfectly normal. No trace of the mess Zelensky and I had faced the night before. No record exists of Benjamin Zelensky or Patrick Davis. Both have seemingly been erased from existence. Davis's last words to me described me as an important part of the puzzle, but I'm not sure how long I'll have to wait before finding out what the hell that even means. I want to investigate Zelensky's disappearance, but I wouldn't know where to start. His office held no evidence either. I've gone back further than to square one, but I'm promising to myself that I'm not going to give up before I find him again. At least, I hope he found his wife again. But I don't trust Davis to keep his word for a second. Well, as Davis said, I'll have to be very patient. So a genuinely weird and wonderful story there. Many thanks to the author Richard Saxon, who you might have seen I've been doing quite a few stories from recently. Quality stuff each and every time. Many thanks to you. Well, that story's finished. Thoughts, feelings, comments, and anything else in the comments section below the video, and I'll do my best to join in the chatter. But that's enough for me for one evening. I'll be back with something completely different on Friday, and I just know you're going to join me. Of course you are. Well, until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye.
Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon. So, come check me out, okay? <laughs>